Hello and welcome to my online class on network information hiding. Um, so this is um, a free online class, but also a class that I teach at the University of Applied Sciences in Worms as part of um, two different other classes. And um, we cover in this class mostly steganography in the network and network covert channels. Um, also fundamental countermeasures will be addressed and at the end I will talk about cyber physical systems or IoT steganography. Short note about me, um, I'm a professor in Worms in Germany and I focus on information hiding and network covert channels since 2006. I did my PhD on that topic but also wrote several books and a few other theses on network covert channels. In the last years, I spent quite some time cleaning up and fixing the terminology and um, addressing methodological issues in this uh, domain. And also I developed several countermeasures together with other people who also do research in the domain. After now 14 years in this research domain, of which um, approximately 10 years um, were academic research years. I have published quite a lot, more than 100 papers or, and books on information hiding. And so I will also cover lots of the stuff that uh, we did on our own in this um, class. I also led a smart building security research team for several years in Bonn. Um, and I also work on operating systems and their security. I wrote several German Linux books and um, founded the International Workshop on Information Security uh, Methodology and Replication Studies. And I'm also interested in scientometrics and retrocomputing. So what will be covered in this course? Um, so first, and this is today's session, we will um, uh, have a look at the fundamental terminology. What is information hiding? What is um, network information hiding? Um, and then next lecture will be on local host covert channels that do not use network capabilities. Uh, this also involves classical covert channels. And then I will discuss in the third lecture fundamental co uh, countermeasures that are also not network specific. And then starting at the fourth session, I will entirely shift or focus only on the network information hiding aspects because this is my domain. So this course is not about digital media steganography and also not about digital watermarking because I'm not an expert in these fields. So in the fourth session, we will cover information hiding uh, basics. Um, and in the fifth one, uh, I will show you the big picture using hiding patterns. So you will uh, get something like a guiding map that leads you through the jungle of all the hiding techniques that are uh, known. And then in the sixth lecture, I will discuss sophisticated hiding methods, how hiding methods can be optimized to circumvent detection methods and um, also uh, limitation and blocking countermeasures. Um, and then in the seventh lecture, I will discuss selected network level countermeasures. In the eighth lecture, replications of experiments. And then uh, let's suppose, oh my God, you found a new hiding method and now you want to publish the work and get famous. Um, how do you describe this method in a paper? How do you do it the right way? Or at least in a way that I think is a good way. And in the 10th lecture, I will discuss um, steganography in the IoT. Finally, there will be a conclusion. Maybe there will be more lectures. Right now, these 11 lectures are planned, but it's imaginable that um, there will be more because there's quite 
a lot to tell and I can easily fill more than one semester with information hiding topics. I will keep these online lectures rather short um, and on the GitHub website, I will link it in the description below, um, you will also find um, reading assignments and links to papers and the slides for download. Um, feel free to use them in your own class and there uh, are also um, um, uh, the the, the practicum parts um, and I will add all these things uh, one after another and will take quite some time. Um, this course um, emerged in 2013 I think when I started teaching this topic or oh, actually even earlier I think 2011 and these slides got um, extended and extended and extended and improved and improved so um, they are not perfect but they grew over the time and I think it's the most um, extensive uh, course on network information hiding and I hope you enjoy it I hope you learn a lot and Maybe you get interested in research or if you have to do, like if you write your thesis about this and I, then I hope it helps uh, what I can tell and teach. And um, yeah, so let's start with the first chapter, which is the introduction to network information hiding. This course is mostly based on our book, Information Hiding in Communication Networks, that was published by Wiley IEEE in 2016. The book should be freely downloadable right now via IEEE Explore. Uh, if you are an IEEE member or if your university is an IEEE member, so uh, chances are good that you can download the book for free. Um, if not, then you can still download the papers. Um, I won't cover all chapters of this book. There are chapters on traffic obfuscation or network flow watermarking and there are also chapters that I cover only very briefly. Um, so it's not that the entire course um, is based on the book but to a large extent and it's also not that the whole book is covered in this course. And this book was written by Wojciech Mazurczyk, myself, Sebastian Sander, Amir Haumann Sader, and Krzysztof Czepierski, uh, all experts in the domain of network information hiding. And um, some of them for much longer than, than I am active in this domain. So um, I also cite their works quite many times in my lectures. I made most of the publications, uh, publication links clickable so that you can work with the slides more easily. And um, I will improve the slides over the time. The latest version of the slides is always on GitHub. So um, this work, this book started, the work on this book started, I think, in 2014 or 15. And Back then we had at least two research communities, the Network Steganography Research Community and the Network Covert Channel Community, and both had uh, different terminology, and this book unified the terminological understanding of both communities. Um, it's like a, like a fix for the research community, and um, that makes it so suitable for this class, and um, I hope it serves you well, and also I hope it serves our class well. So, um, I have to say that my name appears quite a lot in the citations here in this class, um, but this is really because I spent basically my whole research career so far on network information hiding. What is information hiding without the network part? I took these pictures from Wikipedia, um, it shows two examples. On the left side you see a picture of a tree and inside this picture there's another message, a secret message hidden and that's the 
or message in an abstract way. That's the, the picture of the cat. So the picture of the cat is hidden in the picture of the tree. And that's image steganography, or in general, it's steganography. So you hide something in something else. And um, on the right side, you see a 20 euro uh, note, and it contains a watermark. And watermarking is another field of, stick, of information hiding. The fundamental taxonom taxonomy on the domain published by Petit Colas et al. in 1999 um, divides information hiding into four subdisciplines, partially containing further differentiation. For instance, copyright marking is differentiated in different other um, copyright marking domains, and steganography is also split into different domains. Um, there are other taxonomies, but this taxonomy is quite good because it, it shows you what the term information hiding is used for. So it's covert channel research that's um, unforeseen communications, basically. Um, net, uh, steganography research that's hiding something, something else. And fortunately, one can combine covert channels and steganography. This is what we will do in this whole course. And then there's anonymity research. So um, this is about trying to um, hide the, um, the, the identity of communicating parties and copyright marking, where watermarking, digital watermarking also is part of. I read that Information. I'm not a specialist on information hiding history, but um, when I when I um, gave this class in a in a shorter version on a PhD summer school on Lesbos Island in Greece, I thought it would be a good idea to point out that a very early a known application of steganography was in uh, 499 BC, and back then, and that's that's here, that's to Turkey today. Back then, it was Greece, and uh, uh, Histeos, uh, the ruler of Miletus, um, tattooed back then the message on the head of a, of one of his slaves, and so he shaved the head of the slave tattooed the message on the head and let the hair regrow. And after some time, the hair was um, visible again and the message that was tattooed on the head, on the skin, was covered by the hair. And he sent the slave to Aristagoras, his son-in-law, to instruct him to revolt against the Persians. So um, when the slave would um, travel to Aristagoras, then if he got caught and people would search for a secret message, they wouldn't find it because it's hidden on his skin, under, covered under his hair. There are several more cases of steganography known from ancient Greece. Another example of, um, of um, steganography, or in other words, actually it's, it's not entirely known whether steganography was used there. I found this in the book uh, written by Jessica Friedrich, Steganography in Digital Media. I think it's a very well-known book for digital media steganography. Um, so in the 1978 World Championship in chess, uh, Kochnoi um, and uh, Karpov were having a chess game and the officials limited Karpov to consumption of only one type of your court, a violet one, at a fixed time during the game. Why was that? That was because they wanted to prevent that the one who gave him the yoke horde couldn't signal any specific message with with the yoke horde. For instance, if, if a specific color of the yoke horde indicated some, some hint for the chess game, or if the timing of the yoke horde indicated some, some timing uh, related information, uh, timing encoded information, during the chess game, some hint. Um, and they wanted to prevent this. 
which I think is reasonable. And uh, so this this is a well-known case, thanks to the book of Jessica Friedrich. Another example are so-called microdots. They were used by German spies uh, during the Second World War. And um, it's a microscopic message shrink to the size of a dot. And so these, these dots that you see on this picture are containing quite a lot of information, but they appear uh, legitimate if they are placed nicely within uh, some text. But truth is they contain quite a lot of hidden information. And um, so the, the message can be sent via post, postal mail without getting noticed. Another example is printer watermarking. So printers, some printers print hidden information um, on textual output. So if they print a document, they add these yellow dots that encode information about the printer. And they are not recognizable by the human eye, but they are there. And this is like an information leak. Um, so you leak some information out of a network. Even if it's just information about the printer, then it's still something that an attacker could potentially use or that, it, that at least is not foreseen by the users of the printer. Final example, font code. Here's a YouTube video they encode uh, in either digital or printed documents hidden messages in by slightly modifying the shape of um, letters in a text and this is enough information to cover quite some uh, some message like a url in a short text So given that information hiding has many applications and many scenarios, we will further look into this um, soon. I will cover briefly the history of information hiding. So it started, as mentioned, with the case where the slave was sent to Aristagoras with human skin in ancient Greece. However, there were other techniques like Astragali in the, during the Roman times. Um, or textual steganography, musical notes during the Age of Enlightenment, newspaper messages that contained hidden information. Um, what is interesting for us is the difference between traditional and uh, 20th and 21st century methods. So in the 20th century, such methods became um, uh, shifted from the analog to the digital age and it, people started to determine that it's possible to hide information in cryptographic protocols or in digital text like HTML files for instance or in source code or an operating system file system metadata in all media files like images, videos, audio files and in network protocols and recently also in cyber physical systems or the IoT. The difference to the traditional methods, especially if you have a network carrier, is quite important. Um, so in the ancient case where you tattooed the slave to send it to the destination or gave, him, gave the slave some item that looked innocent and but it contains some hidden information then for all for every piece of hidden information you have to send one person or one letter or whatever separately to the destination and that's slow while for the network scenario you can have a continuous flow of information also a pretty quick one and the reply is also pretty quick because the recipient can answer with a few network packets and um, that allows a much better response time. And 
in that sense, modern information hiding techniques are used for basically two purposes. One is covert data storage. So you can store data, for instance, in an image file that would be digital media steganography or in a file system. But you can also transfer information. And that would be network steganography or network covert channel research or local and out of band covert channels. For instance, you can exploit hardware properties or operating system metadata to do this. I will show you examples of this in the next lecture. If we compare, I don't want to go through the whole table here, but if we compare digital media and network steganography further, then What's interested is the method's capacity or bandwidth. So in case of digital media steganography, the, the, the size of the secret message that you can store depends on the size of the file that you exploit. So if your image has 10K, then you cannot secretly store one gigabyte of data in it. In a network traffic case, you are also limited by the length of the transmission and also packet size. And traffic type. And um, what is also interested uh, is interesting is the nature, which is for digital media steganography is permanent. So the secret message is there permanently as long as you do not delete the file. But for the network traffic, it's ephemeral. It disappears once the traffic is transferred. If you do not record the traffic, then it's lost. Which is an advantage and a disadvantage at the same time for both digital media and network traffic, um, depending on your use case. If you want to store the data, then it's just a different scenario than uh, uh, as um, just transferring the data. And then, for instance, executing some malware command or something like that. All right. The basic model that is used for information hiding the basic mimicry system that was um, introduced by Wayne Wright. Um, and uh, this figure here is from our book uh, is as follows. So you have some model and that model has some characteristics that is that these are represented by the star and you have some re recipient. Let's say you have um, a prey predator situation. So this is a mouse and this is a cat and the cat tries to detect the mouse. Now, um, the mouse has some characteristics in its appearance and the, the recipient or cat will detect that it's a mouse. So let's now assume it's uh, a mouse that tries to appear like um, like soil on the ground because of its fur color. So the model would be soil on the ground and that has some characteristics and the cat would say, okay, that's soil and nothing else. Now the mouse would try to appear similarly. It's, so it shows the same characteristics, but there's some plus. And um, this plus is not easy detectable if the mimic is good and this is basically what the recipient has to try to detect so it, it needs to detect the, the difference between the original characteristics and the characteristics that can that have some plus information because let's say the movement of the soil would be strange if it's uh, done in a way that the, that the mouse moves uh, because soil usually only moves by wind or if it's flooded. And in steganography, we try to, uh, in the, the, or the, the stake analysts, the, the ones who try to detect steganography, they have to determine the plus as accurately as possible. Now, we need to go through through some mm, fundamental terminology, but I compressed this into very few slides because I don't want to bore you. I just want to give you the 
absolutely necessary information for the start. If we need more information, I will introduce more information on demand during the next lectures. So don't worry about this. Um, so fundamentally, what is transferred or what is established when we have a steganographic transfer is first of all, even if it's even if it's not steganographic, actually a covert channel that's de defined by Butler Lampson in 1973 as a covert uh, as a communication channel not intended for information transfer, and uh, such a um, communication channel is just there and can be used for unforeseen purposes. It's not foreseen that in a system design that this channel is there, but it's there. For instance, you could have one process in an operating system that increases the CPU load through a simple loop and another that tries to read the, the load of the, uh, of the um, uh, system so that um, you use CPU exhaustion or CPU time consumption to um, signal hidden information. And that's just not foreseen in a system design, but you can use it. Um, later, the Department of Defense, the DOD, in 1985, they published this so-called uh, TCSEC, Trusted, Trusted Computer Systems Evaluation Criteria. I think this was also called the Orange Book. Uh, as part of the so-called Rainbow Book series. And um, they said, okay, such covert channels can break a security policy. Usually in multi-level security, I will go into this detail later, so don't worry about this now. So we have an unforeseen communication channel that also breaks the security policy. And with steganography, you establish such covert channels in a way, at least that's what we agreed in, in the network information hiding community, um, uh, that steganographic methods that hide some data and transfer the data, then these hiding methods create some kind of covert channel that is used to transfer the data because this channel is not foreseen and it breaks a security policy. And what is also important here is the steganography can be informally defined and that's a citation of Friedrich's book again, as the practice of undetectably communicating a message that is called a steganogram in a covert object. So uh, we have Alice that tries to communicate with Bob. And the communication is monitored by a warden called Walter. And in the so-called prisoner's problem defined by Simmons, um, they have no direct way to exchange information. So Alice and Bob cannot directly communicate, only via Bob. So they hand some letter to Wal uh, only via Walter. So they hand some letter to Walter and Walter um, transfers this letter to the other participant. So Alice writes down some letter, gives the letter to Walter and Walter says, okay, I will read the message. Just want to know that you don't tell Bob any uh, unwanted things, and then I transfer the message, I hand over the letter to Bob. Now, if the letter appears innocent, then that's good, and the letter is called the cover object, but they hide some secret information, the steganogram, the secret message in this object that's indicated by the green part here. And if successful, then Alice and Bob have a secret communication channel through Walter, who is not aware of their secret communication. Now, steganography is always done in a way that you have some cover data type, let's say cover image or cover video or cover text that you use to insert some secret, secret information of some data type for instance, an embedded text or an embedded image. So you hide the, the, the secret text, the embedded text into the cover image, for instance. And that process is called embedding. If there's some secret information necessary to determine how it's done, then this is called the steganographic key or stego key. 
And the result of this is called the Stego data type. For instance, Stego image that is transferred to the recipient uh, that also needs some Stego key to extract the information because he needs to know how the data is hidden. And after extracting, the embedded data type is present again. For instance, the originally uh, embedded secret um, text. This process is bijective, so um, you can um, you have a one to one uh, relationship here. Um, it's not that you extract some data and then you get a totally different message, and um, that's that's crucial. Basically, like cryptographic cryptographic operations that uh, cipher some text and uh, have the option to have exactly the same text recovered are also bijective. Uh, hash functions, for instance, are not because uh, they are one-way functions, and you do not want to get back to the original text. And uh, you also have collisions, but that's just a side note here. Final piece of terminology that we need for now is the so-called warden. I already mentioned that Walter is the warden that transfers the message between Alice and Bob, and he might read the message and tries to determine some unfor undesired content. Um, and in a nice paper by Fisk uh, et al, that I also cited quite a few times, I think, uh, they have a differentiation between three types of wardens. So there's the passive warden. The passive warden tries to detect the presence and content of a hidden message in a cover object and also tries to determine whether there's some third party involved in the communication or who is involved at all. If Walter is an active warden, he can modify the cover object to try to remove or replace the steganogram with some innocent content. He can even be malicious. That means he can introduce own messages to fool the involved participants. For instance, by message spoofing. Um, of course, the warden can be passive, active, and malicious at the same time. It depends. And um, as mentioned previously, the Department of Defense in 1985 defined covert channels as policy breaking uh, communication channels that are unforeseen in a system's design based on the definition by Butler Lamson. I just want to cover this briefly to explain you why covert channels were a research subject in multi-level security back then. So multi-level security is uh, a security model where you have security levels of different uh, sensitivity. For instance, you could have a top secret, a secret or a confidential level um, uh, and a confidential level and it's allowed. So if let's say you are John and you have clearance for the secret level, then you can forward and send information to um, the top secret level. And the top secret level can also read your information. This is, by the way, a simplified model of the Bella Padula uh, security model, but um, it's it's enough for us at the moment. And um, but John would not be permitted to read information from the top secret level, and he is also not allowed to send information down to the confidential level. Um, Similarly, the top secret level is not allowed to send secret information to John's secret level and um, the confidential, uh, someone cleared in confidential um, would not have the permission to read data from the secret level. And these um, orange arrows represent covert channels, unforeseen policy breaking communication channels, because the policy, the security policy says, okay, it's, it's not allowed that the a higher level sends information to a lower level and that a lower level reads information from a higher level. So if such a communication is feasible, then a covert channel is present. You might ask, is this applied in practice? Well, yes, it is. 
there are quite some cases. I cited three here. The first three cases are from a paper by Zilenska et al. from 2014. Um, so there are, in short, there are quite some criminal cases where either steganography was um, used to hide some information, some communication, or it's uh, um, um, the case that people think that steganography w might was uh, was probably be uh, involved there. So, for instance, in Operation Twins, there was some um, pedophile organization, and they hit their pornographic material, an innocent-looking uh, material, using digital image steganography. Uh, most interesting here is the Linux 4 k malware that hit traffic in SSH connections. Uh, that was 2013. Um, and since then, we have quite some increase in network information hiding or in general information hiding capable malware. There's even a term for it called Stego malware. A few years ago, the queuing initiative was founded by Wojciech Mazucek. It's a Europol EC3 supported initiative. I'm a member of the steering committee there, and they try to fight uh, information hiding by cybercrime. Also, try to um, um, monitor the progress of what's going on there. Uh, figure out more about this queuing in initiative in our paper information hiding challenges for forensic forensic experts. Um, here on the right side, there is a table from the paper by Kabachet, all the new threats of information hiding wrote ahead from 2018. And as you can see, there are some recent malware cases and um, it's shown which information hiding methods did they use and for which purpose. For instance, um, the NeverQuest malware Used modifications of the last significant bits of half icons, uh, and the purpose was hiding an URL to download the configuration file for the malware. Or the Zbot used um, data appended at the end of a JPEG file to hide configuration data. Um, there are also some network cases, uh, for instance, mimicking Microsoft Messenger and Yahoo Messenger or HTTP conversation traffic by the fake red malware to hide um, command and control traffic for malware. Or the Kabanak Anuak malware was abusing Google Cloud based services to hide CNC traffic. Um, another one was impersonating Netflix traffic. Um, so there are, there are many cases, but in general, one can summarize that they, these malware cases or exploit kits used steganography to perform stealthy command and control channels for botnets or to perform some covert data exfiltration under the radar or to hide confidential data like configuration, um, uh, configuration data. If we try to sort the use cases of steganography, then uh, there are some very bad cases and some good cases. Steganography is not just bad. So of course you can use this for large scale sophisticated data leakage uh, after some spear phishing, for instance, during advanced persistent threat, uh, threats or for stealthy command control channels for malware. You can also use it for the military and secret service or uh, communication that can be good or bad, uh, depending on the situation and use case. But it can also be used by citizens to circumvent censorship and for journalists to um, um, express own opinions in networks with internet censorship so that they have a freedom of speech. But if we focus on the criminal cases, then we can say, okay, it's it's not many cases. It's covert data storage of some kind, covert communication of some kind, where stealthy malware command and control is actually a part of, and the covert data exfiltration as well. But with covert communication tools like a like a chat tool here, uh, so there are different communication purposes.
when a system or network is attacked then there are different attack phases for instance scanning gaining access to the system and maintaining access and you can apply or attackers apply different um, technologies to um, of information hiding to um, to um, perform these actions for instance they try to can try to hide their identity by anonymization techniques during the scanning or, and while they maintain access uh, they can encrypt the traffic by and for instance they can hide the infection process during using encryption and also they can encrypt the common control traffic you can also hide um, data in executables and code by performing obfuscation. However, we mostly focus on communication and using traffic type obfuscation, you can, for instance, let the traffic appear as innocent while it's actually scanning traffic, or you can try to hide the infection process using steganography or traffic type obfuscation, but you can also try to maintain access by realizing a covert data exfiltration or command and control traffic or some covert channel channeling. This class will focus to the largest extent on, on network media steganography. So this is all for the introduction. Thank you for your attention. Next time we will focus on basic covert channels.